let's tell people about your eclectic and wide-ranging CV in endurance sports. Okay, um, well, I was a professional cyclist for most of my life so far. Um, and then I stopped probably about, kind of dating myself now, but I probably stopped about seven years ago, yeah. actually. Then kind of fell in love with running yeah. and kind of found a, maybe a competitive spark again. Yeah. So now I've been doing more long distance show running, yeah. ultra running for the past couple of years. And uh, yeah, just trying to learn everything I can and become a bit of a runner. Yeah. Easier said than done, that's for sure. Yeah. And so going back to your cycling mm -hmm. career, yeah. you did it all, really. Did it all, yeah. yeah. You, you raced one day classics at, at a very high professional mm -hmm. level, grand tours, that yeah. kind of thing. What I'm curious about is you, know, you started in the early 2000s as mm -hmm. a professional. Um, what, what was the route to learning about fueling and hydration back then? Who did you learn from? What did you learn? Yeah, I think back then, I mean, we were sort of guided by let's see our team sports physiologists or team doctors and it seems like at that point they were they were kind of guided by the more widely available science you know which at that point we were still talking about you know 60 grams an hour you know and when i started with with slipstream yeah they were quite progressive and they were pushing quite a lot on the yeah. science side so they were upping it to like 80 yeah. if you could you know and now we would look back and think like wow that's really yeah, really yeah. on the low end considering it's what we're doing now and what we're trying to achieve now yeah. with, with grams per hour but it was mostly that sort of came through yeah. through teams and and learning from from other riders and things like that yeah. what what sort of products were you using then? and were you was there a a, a bigger contribution about real food in cycling then? Yeah, it was really interesting because um, I feel like back then the products uh, are definitely not what they are now. Yeah. So back then I consumed very few gels, yeah. to be honest, because I really struggled. Yeah. And also struggled with a lot of drink mix. Yeah. Um, and that was quite common yeah. in the team. Um, and we also, obviously, we always had our team sponsors yeah. of nutrition brands. Yeah. But mostly what we ate was products made by the Swannies. Yeah. So we would have everything from little um, sort of uh, brioche type buns yeah. filled with ham and cheese yeah. or jam or things like that. But a big proportion um, was real food. Yeah. And also, very fortunately, on Slipstream, we had Alan Lynn, yeah, yeah. who kind of, of course, essentially yeah, yeah. invented the rice cake. So for us, that was uh, very, very nice in the early yeah. days. Yeah, no, Alan's been very influential in like upping the game with, oh, big time. with all that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's oh, interesting because yeah. I remember going and watching the Tour de France as a young lad, standing in a lay-by. I think it was at the bottom of the Galibier with my brother, and the whole peloton stopped for a pee. Yeah. And one of the Rabobank riders gave my brother a, like a little musette. With the and we, yeah. were, we found it fascinating to go through that. And there was, I remember there was pizza in little in tin foil, yeah. and they had rice cakes, and yeah, there was little brioche things. Yeah. But there wasn't, and little tiny cans of Coca Cola. Yeah. But I don't think there was a single sports nutrition product in yeah. the one that we found. And even towards the later part of my career, um, you know, I feel like so much has happened in the last probably five years of yeah. sports nutrition. And I mean, I've been out of the game a little bit longer than that, but even the last couple of years of, of my professional career, um, you know, on our team, we didn't really consume gels until the last hour or two of a race. Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of that has to do with, I feel just the progression and, you know, looking back now, probably one of my biggest factors is that I really struggled with fructose, okay. uh, which I believe a lot of people struggle in, in, in digesting the big amounts of fructose. And a lot of those early sports drinks was always like a big portion of the carbohydrate came from fructose. Yeah, yeah. And I would always just get upset stomach. Yeah, yeah. So I actually only ever drank water okay. yeah. racing. Yeah. Because I just couldn't handle any any drink. Yeah, yeah. And so you used to have to eat a lot then. Eat a lot, but you know, I think looking back now compared to what I'm doing as a runner, um, don't think I was eating enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and definitely like 
probably knowing what I had now, looking back, I probably could have had better performance as a rider yeah, yeah. if that sports nutrition part had been more yeah. dialed. I think we were getting quite good at nailing the the general nutrition, yeah. like at home, yeah. um, and also as I progressed through the years of my career, the team started to, you know, chefs became more prominent. Yeah. Um, general nutrition became better. Yeah. So that part of developed the sort of the sports nutrition side still still lacked a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I would say it's the same for me actually. I think as as a young athlete in the nineties, early two thousands, I taught myself to cook and mm. was pretty good at fueling around what I was doing. Mm. But during activity I always had this kind of mentality that you had to eat something but maybe it was a good idea to not have so much because then you, it would help you lose weight or yeah, sure. it would help you be more efficient on race yeah, day you're yeah. always thinking about maybe I'll burn more fat if I don't yeah. eat as much yeah, and yeah. I look back now and I think I left a lot of performance and long races on the table because yeah. of that. Yeah I mean I, I completely agree and I think you know there's always you know the whole other side of sport or cycling that has come a long way now which is you know weight yeah. power to weight obviously in cycling that's quite an important factor but it's that balance of uh you know weight and power yeah don't get the power exactly yeah. you know so i think that's also something that's come a long way yeah. in the past couple of years in in also looking more holistically at the as at the athlete yeah. and their general health yeah. versus just pure performance but when you actually realize that the better their general health is also the better their performance is you know so i think um you know i was speaking a little bit earlier about how you know these generational changes happen in sport yeah. and when newer younger more progressive ideas start to enter we start to see more changes and, and things developing and and you know we generally look at professional sports well what we consider as professional sports on the outside and we see a lot is still happening. You know, races are getting faster, riders are getting stronger. Um, but then when we sit here and talk about all the sorts of things that we experience, it's, you can almost say that it's like a new era of sports science and new ideas are entering into professional sports that are allowing these next small progressions to happen and, and, and riders to become stronger and or recover better or, you know, generally be, be or people so yeah just happens. yeah absolutely I think that's you know the, the whole point about the the power to weight thing is, is massive that's that has fundamentally changed that yeah. years because it was all about you know all you heard about professional cyclists as an outsider was pictures of people weighing their food to make sure they weren't eating too much yeah. and how horrible it was to do these really long fasted rides yeah. to get down to race weight and that kind of thing yeah. we now know a lot more I think about the fact that you've got to work on your dietary intake if you mm. want to get to a certain weight or whatever but yeah. it's a lot more sort of it follows the getting to the right weight follows doing things right rather than becoming a bit goal in and of itself yeah it's I mean a byproduct. just in itself you know you, you call it fueling yeah, yeah you know it's yeah. to fuel what you are doing yeah. you know it's like you need fuel to be able to train properly like even just for your body to assimilate well you know for recovery yeah. you know making you know just basic things like hormonal balance yeah. and these sorts of things when you're on crazy diets that just makes it so difficult to recover and then assimilate your training really well to yeah. then improve yeah. you know what, what do you also think because you're how old are you now you like, 38 38 so you know, when you're, I always feel like, I'm 44, and I feel like when I was in my early 20s especially, you could get away with doing so many things wrong, pushing yourself so hard, and like, train a, a bit low on fuel, yeah. uh, you bounce back, yeah. and that kind of thing. Whereas now, if I screw it up, if I don't sleep enough, if I don't eat enough, then the penalties are so much greater. Yeah. So, so what do you, how do you find Yeah, that? I mean, I totally agree. I've always, I've always been... Um, a massive sleeper, yeah, yeah. massive sleeper. I really realized how much. That's why Spain suits you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, if I have less than eight hours, I'm not in a good place. But um, I really figured in the last couple of years, going into running and trying to commit some time again to. I guess I really enjoyed being a professional athlete and I really enjoy that lifestyle and I really enjoy training and pushing myself and seeing more based on curiosity of what I can do and like what 
I can get out of my body. Um, but I realized a lot of things and, and you know, definitely running in and itself compared to cycling takes so much more caution and preparation and you know, on the one thing, you know, your physical exertion is is quite well, it's generally more, a little bit more elevated than, than cycling. Yeah. But, you know, from the body standpoint, you really have to take care of it. Yeah. Like, you really have to, like, you know, do your stretching, do your core work, do yeah. your... Um, fueling, for me, has changed massively. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that specifically. Yeah. So, what, how are you approaching your fueling for an ultra now? And how does it compare with what you did as a cyclist? Yeah, I would say in my general day-to-day, my consumption of carbohydrates has gone way up. Yeah. Um, like running, you're kind of always burning. Like yeah. you're always, you're, you're expending so much more energy. Um, and if I look now at, you know, say training peaks or, you know, if you look at a general um, TSS for a week of training, you know, what you do in 15 hours as a runner, you would do in 25 as a rider. Um, and when you start thinking about the amount of time that you actually spend coasting when you're a rider or like we were saying, you know, when I was riding on an easy ride, my heart rate could be at 100 beats per minute or yeah, less, yeah. even sometimes. Yeah. But you're not running at that pace. No. So you're always kind of pushing. And I feel like I really learned that fueling was so important for running because when you bonk, it really sucks. Yeah. You know, you go from running to walking. Yeah. You know, there's no coasting involved. There's no cruising. So there's no hiding in the wheels. Um, so yeah, so you, you were saying that from the cycling days, you could, you can sort of like style, you know, you could potentially style out a bit of a blow up. Yeah, sure, yeah. exactly. Like, you know, if you kind of start to blow a bit, you just sit in the peloton and like get to the end of the stage, yeah, yeah. you know, but in a running race or training, you blow, you're walking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's it. So it becomes so much more important. So my daily carbohydrate consumption has gone way up yeah. just so that I feel like I need it and I feel like to train well and to assimilate it's like just yeah. super important and then for racing um, you know when I started doing trail running races in the last couple of years is when a lot of the science also around pushing more to like 90 grams per hour yeah. as kind of a minimum yeah, yeah. you know if not more if you yeah. can handle it started to come out so I really started to focus on hitting that 90 to 100 grams per hour yeah. in, in, in races um, Initially, when I started, for me, my whole career, hydration has probably been my weakest yeah. point when it came to sports nutrition. Um, like I said, I usually only drank water. I didn't really think about electrolytes much yeah. and salts, mostly because I rarely cramped. Yeah. So to me, previously, it was always, well, if you don't really cramp, yeah, maybe you don't need them. Yeah. You don't really need it. You know, it was always like electrolytes and salts are for if you have an issue yeah. cramping. And so I never really paid so much attention to that. Um, but then, interestingly, in December, I was going to do a, a race in Thailand, yeah. a 100K race at the UTMB Thailand. And I had met Rachel not yeah. long before that. And we were talking a bit about, I was really apprehensive because it was, they're going to be very hot and very humid yeah, yeah. and I was coming from here um, in December but not that it's super cold but you know you're talking about a 20 degree yeah, swing in, in, yeah, yeah. in temperature and generally I'd, I'd always kind of struggled in the heat if it was like my, my first kind of yeah, yeah. that first hot day of the summer that yeah. first hot race of the summer it always kind of hit me hard yeah. so I was a bit apprehensive um, and in speaking to her she was really kind of hitting it home about the electrolytes you yeah, know yeah. like preloading with the electrolytes and then the intake during the yeah. during the event um, and in Thailand I was like okay I just committed and I, I just hit it hard yeah, yeah. and it was really a game changer yeah, yeah like it was one of the first times where I felt like it was really hot but previously I felt like the heat was really roasting me yeah, like yeah. I felt like I was overheating and like I was really hot on the inside yeah. and and it was kind of overwhelming. Um, but that was one of the first times it really, I didn't feel that. Yeah, yeah. Like obviously it was hot and I was hydrating well, but I didn't feel like I ever overheated. Yeah. And 
from that point on, I really realized, wow, obviously the hydration yeah. is really that's big. A, that's such a common story, though, from what yeah. I've heard of, like, especially, I, I had to address the electrolyte issue yeah. that I had when I was racing because it was, it was all about cramp and it was ruining races and it, it was like, it, it was like, if I didn't, I was not going to be able to go. Yeah, sure. For people that don't, then they can maybe dismiss it a little bit, but they don't realise that electrolytes, sodium intake has a massive imp impact on your blood volume. It means you hold on to more of the water that you drink. It means that in hot conditions, you can continue to sweat because because when you get dehydrated, your sweat rate decreases mm -hmm. and then you get even hotter. So it's like a self-fulfilling thing. And it is. I always find it interesting where, yeah, people who... There's a, like a load of people that think, oh yeah, I don't perform well in the heat. Mm. And some people just don't, but yeah. maybe it's, you know, you've got to, because you've got to modify your approach. Yeah. And hydration's a big part. Yeah, exactly. And then so, but also what I was doing before Thailand also was um, sauna training. Yeah. So I hit the sauna, I did like two weeks, where almost every day I did a session in the sauna. Yeah. And then, again, straight away after the sauna, electrolytes yeah. to have make sure they rehydrate really yeah. well so that you know the next day in training isn't really affected or anything yeah. like that so yeah the hydration for me in the last year has been a real sort of game changer yeah, for yeah. sure yeah. yeah it's good to hit yeah. Yeah. Um, and then otherwise just eating as much as I can all the time now really with running and, it, and it's it's a curious thing because you know at the same time you really realize that uh, you know the weight just controls itself yeah you know especially when you push more into you know if you have really the time to train yeah. um, and you're pushing more into that elite amount of training yeah with those hours it just handles itself yeah. you know yeah. like there might be times where you have low weeks where maybe you want to change your macronutrient intake a, a little bit but I feel like now I don't really ever change anything yeah, and I just keep training and if you match it to your energy expenditure, I remember being on a training camp. We were cross country skiing actually, but I was training for running and triathlon. And I remember like one of the one of the guys on the camp asking me if it was healthy to eat like a whole bag of Haribo because that's what I was currently doing at the time. And I was like, Do you know what? If I don't, I feel like it's more unhealthy. Yeah, exactly. When you've got that level of burn going on, yeah. you just need to respond a really, to it. A really interesting thing that I that I learned when I first stopped cycling professionally is well one thing is always to listen to your body yeah and your body will tell you a lot and your body will crave things and will crave things for a reason yeah and when i first stopped and obviously my my training decreased quite a lot i really craved just really green food yeah. like really nutrient dense food yeah. salads vegetables and I didn't crave any of the other stuff. I didn't yeah. really crave the sweets. I didn't really crave. And, but then what started to happen was at that point, if I ate something uh, like fried, yeah. I felt really not great. Yeah, I felt yeah. kind of like sluggish, not good. And then, and then now it's kind of back to this point where um, you're training so much. It really almost doesn't matter what you put in because yeah, yeah. the body is just it's burning at such a rate that what you got put in is yeah. just getting consumed straight away Absolutely. and well, what we res what, what, what athletes yeah. get recommended to eat in a carb load or during a race and that kind of it is all of the stuff that most people who aren't exercising should be getting yeah. out of their diet exactly. processed highly processed yeah. really energy dense yeah. carbohydrate foods. exactly yeah. and I mean now obviously I still eat vegetables and yeah. stuff but like you know I don't eat a big salad every night yeah, yeah. because that means I'll feel full and I can't eat the other stuff yeah, that yeah. I really need to, yeah. to train well the next day so it's really about you know prioritizing that and keeping that in mind and, yeah. and you know your body will tell you when you when you're really missing something yeah. and you feel like you need it and it's just about yeah listening yeah do you think that I suppose being you know being a cyclist and the amount of hours you spend training that must put you very very in touch with your body yeah, I mean, very, because at a certain point, like it used to be if I went out and, you know, <laughs> to many of the mechanics' despairs, but like, nah, guys, I think that stem you put on my bike is actually a couple mils shorter than yeah, yeah. what it says it is. And actually got to the point where, um, you know, on our team, because we were using aluminum stems, yeah. and because aluminum stems are like with an extruded process. Yeah, yeah. So... They actually, if you had five stems that are all 120 mil, 
they can actually range from like 117 to 124. Yeah, yeah. So the mechanics had to start measuring manually <laughs> each stem and then putting a sticker yeah. with the exact measurement so that every one of your bikes was within a millimeter yeah. because you would feel everything. Like you put on a new, a new pair of bib shorts with a fresh chamois you have to drop the saddle a little bit because yeah, it just yeah. felt like it was just like half yeah. a mil or a mil this yeah. or that made a huge difference but yeah i mean you felt everything every single thing everything yeah, yeah. that's yeah. pretty wild that's, yeah that is yeah that's when you spend a lot of time doing the same thing over and over yeah, yeah. i've got one more question for you yeah. to wrap up um changing it up a little bit it's to do with it's to do with caffeine because you obviously have a strong appreciation for caffeine with, the, with what you do with your coffee shops yeah. and those kind of things did you did you use caffeine as a rider and did you use it as a runner uh, apart from just having a coffee yes i mean obviously we own a couple of coffee shops and everything uh i don't drink that much coffee which yeah. most people assume just hammering it all day uh, i generally only have a couple of coffees a day yeah. uh, two or three <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah caffeine for me is an interesting one that I'm actually probably just starting to get back into more trying to dial that in yeah because I think it's something that can be very useful but one thing that I I found and a reason I was probably slightly apprehensive yeah. before about using it so much in racing was that I felt that if you're going to use caffeine you really have to be on top of yeah. your carbohydrate intake yeah. and other things because I felt like if you were close to like on the limit of running out or being low on glycogen, yeah. tapping into too much caffeine just like put you over the edge yeah. and like led you to either to bonk or to do something. Yeah, so yeah. It made you feel quite jittery like, if it's on an empty stomach sometimes. So yeah. it really felt like you had to have everything dialed to really have like when you kick that caffeine that you've just got the like yeah. the reserves to like really boost it you know yeah. well, uh, we um we we talk about like fluid salt and carbs mm -hmm. being the three fundamentals and caffeine kind of being like the the next thing when you've nailed those three then caffeine's the one to look at but don't go looking at caffeine before yeah. you get those three right yeah but i've really so i generally do take some caffeine in races just through through gels like the last race on the weekend I would have taken in a total of 150 milligrams yeah. through two yeah. through two gels, but it's something that I'm really interested to understand more in depth yeah. and how that can really use that to to make it, you know that next little step in, in performance. But yeah, no, it's something I definitely would like to get more into. Yeah, cool, good stuff. Well, based on your two to three coffees, really, I still have one coffee available today so Me too. I think I'm going to uh, take that take that now thank you very much yeah, cheers